down. Hi, this is Julie, so sorry. Um, I am the Associate Director for the Reed Foundation, and I'd like to introduce you to our host today, Louise Phipps Theft, an internationally recognized mediator, will explain how to use media mediation and conflict resolution tools and techniques to help people living with paralysis, as well as their families, better advocate for their needs. And I want to now turn it over to Bernadette, who will explain a little bit about what the Reed Foundation does and our Paralysis Resource Center. Hi, Bernadette. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Bernadette Morrow, and I'm the director of the Information Resource Center. Um, and um, welcome to our presentation today, um, by uh, sponsored by Hollister. Um, we have, as Julie said, a guest, Louise. Um, who herself has a um, son who has a spinal cord injury. And um, while already working as a mediator, she has had personal experience um, dealing with the medical community on her own, specific to her son's um, care. Um, we're very fortunate in that Louise has come through the Paralysis Resource Center as a um, family member looking for assistance and information. Um, and then has moved forward, as has her son, Archer. Um, I'm having trouble with the slides. Could somebody? Um, I apologize. Yeah, I got you. Hang on. Uh, today's Care Paralysis Resource Center. The Paralysis Resource Center was started by Dana Reeve, and the goal is to help people navigate the chaos of paralysis with reliable information, referral services, and a message of hope. And that's something we always hope to deliver. The Paralysis Resource Center was opened in 2002, um, and we are made up of four key components. We have the information specialist who we consider as the heart of the, the PRC, and they take emails and telephone calls, and they help family members um, navigate their way. Uh, so you may consider them your personal guide um, through the paralysis. Uh, we also have a peer and family support program. The Peer and Family Support Program, or PFSP, works in combination with the Information Specialist team, and they assist in matching individuals one-to-one, -one, both people with paralysis as well as their family members. And um, we hope to provide them information and resources from people who are there and so that they know that they're not alone. Another program we have that is very popular is our Quality of Life Grants. The Quality of Life Grants program has awarded over 2,700 grants, totally more than $23 million in funding uh, for other nonprofits um, that mirror the Reef Foundation mission. Um, these organizations improve uh, physical and emotional health, as well as access to independence for individuals who live with disabilities. Lastly, we have a military and veterans program that has been in existence since 2003. Um, and we address the unique needs of our service members um, who have been injured both in service as well as non-service related. Um, and um, we assist them moving through the VA, um, answering any questions specific to mobility impairments, um, as well as um, getting the most out of their benefits. Um, we also have a peer and family support program that is specific for military and veterans. And we have a branch that we have just launched as a um, pilot program from the Palo Alto VA. The Resource Center, the PRC, offers many free materials and resources. Many people are familiar with our uh, trademark uh, paralysis resource guide, but we also have some wallet cards that are critical um, in the event of an emergency. We have the autonomic dysreflexia card, sepsis, as well as deep vein thrombosis. Um, we have fact sheets. 
of over 200 fact sheets on our website, as well as uh, a fact sheet for every state that can help you find resources where you live. Lastly, we started a um, series of publications, many of them also sponsored by Hollister. Um, we have bladder management, bowel management, pressure injuries, and we recently have um, one on spasticity that has been updated. And our uh, uh, other one was on knowing your rights in parenting, uh, so that um, individuals that have parents that may be going through a separation can help ensure um, their uh, parental rights. Our online community is, uh, consists of on-demand videos that on, off of our YouTube station. We have paralysis-related blogs and webcasts, much like the webcast you're currently attending. We have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and online forums. And then we also have our monthly web chats. With that, I will hand it over to Louise, and you can take control of the slides. Thank you. Louise, we are unable to hear you. Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be on this call, and I thank the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation, and in particular, the Paralysis Resource Center. Uh, Bernadette Morrow, whom you just heard from, uh, really is, I can attribute our being rescued in our plight um, in the uh, spinal cord injury um, crisis that we were in from moving from one facility to another. So I'm very grateful to the Reef Foundation and I'm just thrilled to be on this webinar with you all today. And for Hollister for seeing the need that uh, we might be able to begin to fill with regard to advocacy, relational advocacy services when you are in crisis. Um, Bernadette mentioned that we have a son who is, was injured, and he is now 19. It was in 2015, two and a half years ago, when he was 17. Um, they, the Reed Foundation asked me just to give you a little thumbnail sketch uh, before we can really get into what you have, have called about, um, but just so that you can get some sense of where we have been, if it is at all um, pertinent for you. Our son was um, injured from a diving accident into the Atlantic Ocean when he hit a sandbar. Um, he is what is considered um, a C2 to C5 burst. He's an Asia A complete. And we spent the first six months on every kind of support, um, including um, life that was uh, taken from him from medical error and from the injury itself. So from feeding tubes and not being able to speak and chest tubes and pacemaker and ventilator and trach and the, really the landscape for um, someone who can be injured in, in this way, um, we have been there and it was through relational advocacy and a belief um, in God and, and really what um, is in store for each person that we're, we're doing pretty well right now. Um, I will share with you that we were in five different facilities um, in our first seven months, um, and most of them were ICUs. And we have since um, been committed um, <laughs> in lots of ways. We are committed uh, to, to rehabbing here in Baltimore, Maryland, which is where we're located. Uh, but our son has been able to attend college this past year in Philadelphia at Penn, and we can talk about um, that kind of care as well. But I just really want to thank the Reeve Foundation. And when we were uh, discussing this webinar and thinking what would the title be, really, what, what the real title should have been is when the you-know-what hits the fan. <laughs> so um, as a mediator by background, an attorney by background, and someone who believes deeply um, in people's capacities, um, I am here to share with you what um, was relational advocacy 
really at work, um, beginning with the hospital uh, setting. So I'm, would, I'm going to run through some slides with you if you're able to see them. If not, um, you have me, and I look forward to hearing from you all with um, questions and answers. So the idea of, um, let's see here, Julie, I'm trying to move this, these slides along. You are not alone. I asked our son, Archer, just today, uh, I said, Arch, I'm going to be on a webinar, and I'm just curious what you think would be the most important thing for me to share with other people who are traveling this journey, whether you are a family member of someone who has uh, been injured, spinal cord injury, or whether you are yourself paralyzed, or whether you are a friend or a family member. Of, of someone, a family whom you know has um, suffered this kind of experience. And he said, tell the mom you're not alone. And that actually was my first slide. Uh, so what does that mean you're not alone? Well, what happens in conflict, which is my field of, of expertise, is that when you experience conflict, two things happen. You can become, and we all do, no matter how strong and no matter how grounded we are in conflict, we become weaker and we become self-absorbed. And one of the last things that we oftentimes think about doing is really asking for the kind of help that we need. And when you are facing a crisis um, such as paralysis, whether it's in the acute phase or whether it's in the years thereafter transitioning phase, asking for help is so important because so many people want to give it. They do. Surrounding yourself with the right teams, and we consider for our family that we have a lot of teams. We have our medical team. We have our home accommodations team. We have our home care, nursing, CNA team. We have our food team uh, when we were in crisis. And if we you know, go underwater again, we'll call upon them as, again to nourish us. And we have our research team, those who keep their ears and their eyes out for us, ears to the ground on what's happening in the spinal cord community. And that's really where the Christopher Reeve Foundation comes in uh, incredibly so much so itself. But knowing that you are not alone is critical. It calms the heart, it calms the racing mind, and I'll add to that uh, a spiritual component, and that is when you can feel the presence, if indeed you are someone who has faith and you don't have to have faith, you could simply believe that there is something larger than you are, and that's good enough. When you can feel a presence of, of God for us, uh, but some team, you are never, you are never alone in this. And if I become part of, of your team, you will not be alone either. Our next slide. Julie, are you able to help me with that? Great. So a relational skill set. Um, for us, it really saved our child's life. Um, we also believe it can prevent medical errors and it can save your own life. Um, that includes the one that you have that you're, as you're interfacing with your family. What does that mean, a relational skill set? Well, you might have questions, for instance, around uh, being moved from one facility to another or being given medical information that seems in conflict with other information that you have received. Or it could be that um, one doctor is recommending something, but um, it doesn't appear in the in, in reports, if you will, that you're going back to. Or that um, you are might even be at odds with your family member who has who has suffered the injury. Skill set that is focused on both yourself and the other person can move mountains. What does that look like? It looks like listening first. Even though your mind is racing, you want to probably sometimes claw somebody's eyeballs out, and you know that you have to be grounded. If you can listen and suspend your judgment 
while the other person is giving you that information. And the second skill is to reflect back exactly what he or she has said, not what you think he or she said, not what you are interpreting him or her to say, but if you can reflect back exactly in their words what they have told you, a really amazing, magical thing happens. It's actually related to neuroscience. But the speaker, whether it was a physician or whether it was a hospital ombuds person or whether it was a family member or whether it was an insurance adjuster, they can hear themselves. And they will often hear the disconnect. They can hear themselves. They will often add additional information. If you can listen and reflect back, that unto itself can begin to move the conflict that you have with someone else. And you don't have to be in conflict with someone for this to be an incredibly important, what I call the relational two-step skill. From that position, you can then ask a lot of questions. And again, when you ask, the response will come, and you will listen, and you will reflect back exactly what you heard again. And if you need to ask another question, you will continue with this dance. It is in this process that differences that you may have get sharpened. And if you are able to ask open questions, if there is a disagreement and such question, is, is there anything else I need to know, that can begin to open up a pathway for the person with whom you are disagreeing or simply not understanding or saying that that doesn't make any sense to me, they have a chance to be able to share with you what might be the answer to your question. And if it is not, you can stay in that, that dance. The, the, the trick is that a lot of people are not willing to give you the time to do this. But you can demand that time by simply saying, I'd like to be able to understand, could you please say again what you just said? There is no one I have experienced in the medical profession who is not willing to do that. The relational skill set can save your child's life. It also can prevent medical errors. When you ask something, someone comes in and they're about to uh, give a new drug or they're going to put something, uh, they're going to replace the drip bag um, of one of the uh, uh, IVs in your loved one. And you say, can I just see the label on that again? Can you tell me what that is again? And they say this and you repeat it back. Because sometimes you don't know what it is. And they might say, and it happened to us on occasion, not not many times, it happened once, where the nurse said, oh my goodness, I, I'm so sorry, that I, I've, I've got the wrong one. And I only did that because we did experience a medical error where blood pressure medicines were put into a saline drip bag when I wasn't asking questions like that. And it caused Archer to have a heart attack, very flatlined for six minutes at three o'clock in the morning. So this kind of a skill set where you listen and you reflect back is truly very, very powerful. Julie, thank you. Take nothing at face value. Um, as a continuation of asking a lot of questions, uh, we all know, and, and if you are on this call and, and you don't know yet, doctors and hospitals operate in silos. Um, I think they realize that. I think they are, for, are forlorn about that and wish that they didn't, but they do. And so you have an incredibly important role to help to bridge those gaps. Insurance companies also operate um, in what I would say a transactional silo. Um, you and your family are just one case, um, and your job 
is to be your child's advocate, his or her eyes, ears, and voice, indeed, if they don't have one. And if they do have a voice, it's to translate their voice to all of these others. Take nothing that you're told at face value, not that you are at odds with it, just that there is more. We journaled everything. I also was journaling in real time to keep my family up to date, and indeed that got posted, and it was that communication itself, uh, taking nothing at face value, that connected our family to the Reeve Foundation, which really goes back to the you are never alone. Our next slide is on being open to changing the dynamic. The dynamic is around communication, and what you want to be able to do is to engage relentlessly. What we found, and seeing a number of other families whose loved ones, uh, namely their children, had suffered from a spinal cord injury, they, they took not only everything that was said to them at face value, it was as if the medical profession got placed on a pedestal, um, as if the family also did not know best. Um, as if the family did not know and that the injured person, uh, the loved one, in this case your child, my child, um, knew, knew less and would, would not have a voice. No, no, no. Change that dynamic and engage relentlessly. Admit what you don't know. So for me, it was saying to doctors regularly, I am not an anesthesiologist. I am not a physiatrist. I am not a neurourologist. But I know, what I do know is this is what's happening with my son right now. I am not a X and X and Y and Y. But, but what I am is a mom, and I have eyes, and I, and I see this, and I have ears, and I hear this. Can we talk about that? Changing my thinking to when people would speak to me in the hospital, maybe, okay, and maybe not. And I would go back to questioning. What about this? Might we try that? What does this mean? In hospitals, the dynamic is one that is, um, as, as you all know, treat and move on. It is not necessarily around healing, and it is not necessarily around anything other than what is placed right before them. So the idea of changing the communication dynamic is that there is something that's called a consequence from something else that's done in the hospital. And that maybe, maybe not kind of thinking and engaging relentlessly, again, with your relational skill set, is very, very powerful. So, for instance, in the hospital, if they said um, that something was going to be happening or they were moving our son, I would say, okay, and, and why is that happening? And it'd be like, uh, you know, because we have not scheduled for blah, 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 blah. Um, or we're going to be having surgery. We're going to be putting in, this is, this is what we saw in an x-ray, and we're now going to be doing this. Well, wait, wait a minute. Maybe, maybe that is what we need to do, but maybe it isn't. Because when we put in that pacemaker or his diaphragm, what does that mean for the pacemaker that we put in for his heart? No one had thought about that. They certainly would have thought about that when he was in surgery and before they were prepping him. We were thinking about it days and a week or plus ahead of time. That's part of the maybe, maybe not. When they come in and they want to give your child or your family loved one another narcotic, well, wait, wait a minute. What is that? And what, why are you giving that to him? Well, uh, we, we think that this will um, help increase his appetite, but that's a narcotic. Well, it is, Mrs. Sampson, and you're, you're right. It, it is used uh, for, for you know, matters related to anxiety and so forth, but, but it also can speed up the appetite. And what we'd like to see is that he would be eating more. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe and maybe not. Aren't there other ways that we can stimulate appetite? So being open 
to changing the conflict dynamic, especially when you can follow your nose. <laughs> you can know that you're going to take your loved one home, you pray. And you're going to want to look ahead at what that looks like. And in our situation, I was hoping to have a child and planning on having a child who is not going to be addicted to drugs and narcotics when he left that hospital after all those months and who was going to thrive. That's just one example. But if something isn't going well, request a meeting regularly and often and have that meeting face-to-face. Hospitals are not used to having meetings with patients and patients' families. They're used to having plenty of meetings amongst themselves, um, including rounds. But to have a meeting with you and your family changes the dynamic unto itself. And have that meeting. Be prepared for that meeting. It doesn't have to be an adversarial meeting. It's an information meeting, and you're going to use that relational skill set to listen and reflect and listen and reflect and ask open questions. And when something isn't going well, you do not have to pussyfoot around that. You can say, something is really not going well here, and I need to make sure that something is done about that. What I am requesting at this meeting is information so that all of us, you with your medical expertise and we with our family expertise, can come up with the best possible next step and look at the consequences of that so that it is the right next step. That changes the communication dynamic. If we go to the concept of healing, where we can create a healing sanctuary, hospitals, sometimes even our home rooms, rooms in our home where our loved ones will be, are not necessarily healing sanctuaries. And if we're really about the business of thriving, thriving during and after paralysis crisis, a healing sanctuary is an easy thing to create. And indeed, I will share with you that while it can be met with resistance in hospitals, I think only because it's so unusual, once you establish it, the staff in hospitals will come into your room because they too experience the healing. So what is a healing sanctuary and what does it look like? Well, it can start with smell. So for us, it was essential oils. Um, When we were in really rough times, I had peppermint in all the corners. I I thought I was warding off, you know, all the evil that could be in the room. You know, ICUs are full of death. I did not want death in the room of our son. Um, We moved later to lavender, which is an essential oil that for people who suffer paralysis, oftentimes on ventilators, they have a difficult time breathing, and lavender is good for the lungs. It is also important to know how smell can be so uplifting of the spirit. And so each time, every time, before we would have surgery um, or when there was going to be something that was very critical, I would change our essential oils to frankincense, which we know uh, the wise men brought when Jesus was born as something that really lifts the spirits. It's something that was ceremonious. We had soft music on regularly, not music that was harsh, uh, not music with a lot of words that were harsh, oftentimes nature, uh, sounds of waterfalls, uh, the kinds of sounds that can transport The brain and brain waves uh, can soften them and can calm. We filled Archer's room with photos of his friends and our family, photos of nature, things that were familiar to him. And we made sure that we kept his body on the rhythm of what would be daytime and nighttime. And it was probably where our greatest... um, Uh, conflicts came with the hospital and I wanted to close the the door of the room. I wanted to close the curtain all day long so we could blot out the noises um, in the ICU as well as in the regular hospital. And at night, I wanted the lights turned out. Now, Archer had nine monitors, uh, so the blue light was tremendous. So I, I became the eyes for those 
those blue lights. And you can do that too and sort of negotiate with the nursing staff that you know, you'll keep your, your eye on, on some things or maybe you can have other family members. But the request of nurses to not flip on the lights and, and poke and prod all times of the night just because they happen to be on the night shift is very, very essential to creating a healing sanctuary. And they'll say they can't do their job. And you'll go back to what we just talked about, maybe, and maybe not. I had tiny little pen lights. They came in. I handed them one. I had notes on the door that said, this is a healing sanctuary. If it's nighttime, please knock softly. Um, there's a pen light on the table. And you can also, in your healing sanctuary, which was important for us, you can adopt your favorite prayer. You can put it on the outside of the door. You can recite that around your loved one. It is so calming for people when they are out of control in their bodies to know that there is a circle of healing that is around them at all times. And part of that healing sanctuary would be to never leave your loved one. Always have somebody there with him or her. Always in that room recording in journals, knowing exactly what happens with each person who comes in and comes out. Something else to consider, next slide, is creating a comforting home away from home because that's where you're going to be. So, yep, you just probably are going to need to camp out. And if you're in the hospital these days for more than, you know, two nights, it tends to be pretty serious. Um, for those who suffer from spinal cord injury, it's weeks, if not months. So bring in your favorite tiny little lamp on your favorite blanket and your journal. Um, and, you know, get, get used to um, a hospital room as, as your room. Don't resent it. Uh, just make it your home away from home. Um, seek out what will cheer you up. Let friends know what you need. Have food delivered when you need it. Ask for texts. Um, have people bring you things there. It's your cocoon and your family member. When they feel that that kind of space has been created around them, it's very, very comforting. That's, that's what we were told. The next is to work towards very clear communication. We talked about this, but I want to really drill down to the kind of communication that is needed between physicians. Because of the silos, you and you have a right to be able to know about a test. Now, people in the hospitals will say things like, they'll say crazy things to you actually, like, oh, we can't give you that because of HIPAA. <laughs> I'll say, HIPAA? Whom is HIPAA to protect? We are the patient. And this was when, when my son was still a minor, when he was 17, and then when he turned 18. And I'd have him sign something so I could also speak for him. They're just not used to giving information on the spot. They'll, they'll say you can go to medical records. Well, forget that. Medical records is going to take what could be days or week, and they'll also charge you a dollar a page or whatever it is. And it's definitely the whole, you know, kit and caboodle. Take pictures. When there is a test, when there is um, an MRI, when there's a CAT scan, when there's an X-ray, before it blips off the screen, pull out your phone. Take a picture. That's what I did. Not only does it give you a good record for clear communication, it allows you to show the next expert physician when they come in what the other expert physician had done earlier. Because oftentimes in the helter-skelter world of hospitals and ICUs, the doctors are not reading a week's worth of, of notes. And in our case, it was boxes and boxes of medical records. They're reading the most recent. So you are the archive for what it is that has happened as, as your son or daughters or family members best advocate. The other thing that really worked for us, and it became a litmus test, is I got the cell phone number of the physicians whom I knew I was going to need to check back with. And those who wouldn't give me their cell phone numbers, I would try and negotiate and say, I, I promise I would not be calling you unless it were an emergency. And then I would say, I'll tell you why I want it. Because 
I'm putting together a team, a team for our son, the best team out there. And I think you're pretty good, and I'd like for you to be on our team. And so I'd like to be able to have this if you're willing to give that to me. And when they did, it was such a clear example of being relational because they had to trust me that I wasn't going to pepper them with calls. But I'll tell you, guess who used my text number more than anybody else when I was in the hospital? The other physicians. They liked having me. They got excited about some of the things that were happening with Archer, and they also saw some of the dangers. And they would text me and ask me if I could contact them to other resources that we had at other hospitals because I told them I would do that. And it would be something like uh, a, a quick text. Um, we, we, have, we have some results. Um, can you please put us in touch with the surgeon in Atlanta um, who was on, on long duty, basically, for our son with his ventilator? Those kinds of connections were made. It was invaluable for knitting together the silos. And I kept a journal of every single person who came in and what was happening and any report. And the other part of clear communication in hospitals that you can do that is a real game changer, every morning there are daily rounds. Now, depending on where you are, you might be, you might be rounded at 6 a.m. You might be rounded at noon. But your room dictates typically the time of how it is that the rounding teams come through. Insist on being part of those daily rounds and insist that your child or your loved one is part of those daily rounds as well. Our son Archer was not able to speak um, in, in the beginning because he was intubated and then his vocal cords were severed, um, still a bit of a mystery, uh, and then he was on the ventilator. But he could communicate with a board that we got of, you know, ABC just at the uh, CVS Walgreens. And I would prep them ahead of time. If there was something that was important for him, I would say, let me know what what you want. I'm going to ask for it for you. And if the rounding team came in, and they always did, and, and we were at teaching hospitals as well, and so sometimes there could be as many as 10 people on a round in their, in their white coats kind of stroking their chins but not having anything to say or, or, or say to us, I would ask them. I would say as an advocate, what is it that, you know, you think about this? And I want to know, your, what are you, Mr. So-and-so, or Ms. So-and-so, or Dr. So-and-so? What is your name again, please? What is your specialty? Can you please share what you are thinking with our son right here? He can hear you. And that conversation would happen, and I'd look at Archer, and I'd say, Arch, um, do you agree with that? Because you can blink. You blink once and show them. For instance, when we were trying to get him off of narcotics, i say, you know, blink, blink once. If it's yes, you want off of that drug. Blink twice. If it is no, you want to stay on that drug. And they would look at him. He would blink. And the good news on that particular score is he would blink once. And that was a game changer because we involved him in the rounds. It's, like, it's often the only time you're going to have more than one or two physicians gathered at the same time. Being an advocate, um, it goes without saying um, that you need to engage with everything, but you engage with strength and openness, especially when things are difficult. The other aspect of being an advocate that I want to share with you is really painting the picture for the medical team of the child that you have. Uh, you know, let them know about this person who was, what, what he was like in our case. You know, the, the, the star that you see, the beautiful person that you see he is and that he is still. Let them understand that. Tell them about the gifts that he had before the accident. Um, you know, in our case, he was, he was musical. He could dab around with, with the piano. He was a beautiful portrait artist. He was, a, he was a great athlete. He loved lacrosse and soccer. Let them know those things about, about your child. That's another way of advocating so that they can never lose sight of that full person 
might be paralyzed, but there is a complete full person there. And then the other aspect of advocacy that I would like to really share with you and hone in on is how it is that you can advocate for integrative medicine and alternative medicine alongside Western traditional medicine while you are in the hospital and while you are in rehab and years later while you are in rehab. And what am I speaking about? I'm speaking about food supplements, nutritional supplements, putting fish oil and insisting on probiotics in the feeding tubes when you're in the hospital, bringing in an acupuncturist, a reflexologist, a massage therapist, all kinds of things that allow for your loved one, your child to heal. The next thing I will share with you is that on advocacy, advocating relationally, not only with the medical experts, but advocating relationally with the insurance companies. Because you can expect that you're going to be denied many things. Yes, you've got to be prepared to appeal. And yes, you better be prepared to use your credit card. And in our instance, we had to scramble to get enough credit on our credit card for things like $25,000 medical jets take us from one facility to another. You know, you live on a prayer in these instances when you get that call and, and, you know, you have to be able to pay for it because the insurance company is not going to. Will they later through appeals? High likelihood, and it's going to take some work. But that kind of advocacy is the exact same. It is relentless, and you ask maybe and maybe not. You know your choices. And you paint the picture of your loved one to them as well and what they are going to need. And for instance, beds. They're going to issue you a medical hospital bed when you come home. No, you know better than that. You know that there are other beds available. You can do your research and you will engage with them. And the idea of every single time an insurance company calls you, which in those first weeks and months, for us at least, could be quite regularly, as in every two, three, five days, Return that phone call as fast as you can. Because when you don't, they can often pass you along to another representative. And you have lost all the traction that you had been building. Alternatively, if you're not getting anywhere with the person that you're talking to, ask for another representative. If you don't return that person's call, you're probably going to get one anyway. That's the good news. But it's not so good because they put things in their records, such as non-responsive um, and things that can really label you poorly in their eyes. And you don't want that. You want to have a relational experience with the insurance companies as well. So another aspect of advocacy, we can move our slides along here, Julie, is insisting on information face-to-face. -face. Um, you know, I mentioned this, it kind of is strewn and laced throughout, but there's nothing like talking with a physician, with a nurse, with a therapist, with anybody else face-to-face. -face. I got my best information talking to those who had just taken the x-ray, those who are on the MRI machines, those who are transferring and transporting our son, when we were face-to-face. -face. Related to that is creating an emotional connection to the doctors. Um, we've really talked about how you paint the picture of who your loved one is, um, but it's more than that. Next slide, please. You have to be relentless, absolutely relentless, in creating an emotional connection for them about what is possible medically. There are a lot of naysayers in the world of paralysis, and there are a lot of hopeful people. And we are looking for the hopeful people. And if you are 
coming face to face and you know right up to a barrier of someone who basically says it's the end of the road there's nothing more we can do uh, you're going to be moved out of this facility um, time's up uh, you, you no longer have any more days on your insurance plan that emotional connection that you make with your doctor believing in what is possible can absolutely be called upon as a resource for them to be able to give you the kind of letter that you need in what could be a soft appeal, what could be a, just a verbal appeal within the hospital itself, or what could be a formal appeal. We relied upon that. We had good relationships with our doctors who were willing to say what I needed them to say because I learned from the interaction with the insurance company through relational advocacy with them what would be needed in order to prolong, let's say, a stay in one facility or in order to prolong a particular type of therapy before we were cut off. Creating an emotional connection for your doctor and with your doctor can be really critical. Knowing you have options. You always have options, and it is so important. So I'm going to wind some of this down. If I could go to the next slide, please, Julie. Well, we've already talked about, and I hope that you do, question um, a lot of things. You want to create your team of believers, people who have an imagination, people who can see what you see as possible. And if you fall down on that job yourself, that you actually don't see what's possible, as your friend, I'll say, shame on you. <laughs> as your relational advocate, I'll say, I totally get it. But you can't give up because there is so much potential out there and things are happening. You're having faith in something that is larger than Western medicine. You're having faith in something that is larger than just what happens in a hospital or a rehab facility is critical. And you want your doctors and your rehab team and your nurses and your family, home, health, and care providers to see that possibility with you. Why expend energy, precious energy, having to convince people when you can create a team of believers. And that includes a research team if you, if you get so lucky. With that, I will leave you with, I mentioned when all else fails. Yes, pick wisely. If you need to in a hospital, go to an ethics review, then ask for an ethics committee to review something. Sometimes just the very um, statement that that's something you intend to do, not an idle uh, something, a very serious something, sends a quick message where things can, can, can oftentimes change. But that is very powerful when all else fails. In our situation, I also went around uh, a number of people. There was one particular unit we were in for months, and um, they were just not equipped to deal with our son. There were so many errors. He was being injured. He was practically being dropped. Um, he, he was his his bowel program was completely messed up because they weren't willing to do uh, bowel stim. And I absolutely went around them. I went to the top in the hospital. I hope you don't have to do that, but if you do. Um, as part of what Hollister is, um, is sponsoring, I, I will help you with your own relational advocacy. Slog it through. Um, it is worth it. And one of the best things to do when all else fails is also to ask for a meeting. And if you need a mediator to help you with that meeting, that can be a real core value. So I will finish and open it up for some questions. That holding hope is a value. And it is something that you want to hold constantly. You want to have relentless engagement and holding hope constantly because there is something larger than you. 
You have faith in miracles, as we did. We're seeing our creative miracle. It unfolds for us every day. Just the fact that our son is alive is a mystery and something that we celebrate. His progress is just icing on the cake. There's something larger than you are. God has a plan for all of us. And those, we believe, who hope for everything, obtain everything. I welcome your questions with the time that we have remaining. And thank you. And I really look forward to working with any of you who think that I could be at all helpful. Bernadette, do you want to say something about that? Yes. Um, first off, um proud to announce that the Paralysis Resource Center is going to um, offer Louise his services to um, Paralysis Resource clients through uh, Hollister sponsorship. And the best way to be referred um, for assistance is to call one of our information specialists. They will be your starting point. And you can call 800 539-7309 and inquire about this service. Um, the information specialist will take your contact information and then um, on, on June 1st, we will begin um, assistance with families with mediation services uh, with Louise. Um, we have contact information. Uh, this is the final slide. But as uh, the Paralysis Resource Center does with all of our presentations, we use a quote from Christopher Reeve, nothing of any consequence happens unless people get behind an idea. It begins with one person or an individual, and they share the idea with more individuals, and eventually it becomes a movement. And with that, um, Julie, will you take over with the questions, please? Sure, Audra, would you let the participants know how they can ask an audio question? Certainly. Again, if you do have a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. A voice prompt on your phone line will indicate when your line is open. Again, that is star 1. So I have some questions that have uh, come in um, through texting function. If I may, um, so a, a caller or a writer has said that um, there's a patient who has motor loss in both legs and their MRI shows multiple level spinal cord compression, but the doctor will not explain it. I hope that in what just uh, preceded that you have some ideas about what you can do about that. Um, calling for a meeting it formalizes things if you need to do that. And practice before you have that meeting with listening and reflecting. And if you have specific questions, write them down. It also really helps to frame a meeting with what I call the positive frame, but that actually comes out of neuroscience. And that would be, I would like to have a meeting uh, by you know, the end of the day today, if that is possible, with Dr. X so-and-so. Uh, because we've got questions about uh, what the MRI shows, and we hope it will be a productive meeting for both of us, uh, but we have some, some serious uh, concerns and questions. That lets them know it's serious, lets them know that you're positive, and that it needs to happen right away. We have another um, question that says, our son's application for a long-term residential facility has been rejected on the basis of his behavior. He certainly has many difficulties, past and present, but we feel that the facility and all it has to offer would be the catalyst to change. So I, I see that the question is probably, how do you get that application um, revisited? It, as I don't know where that facility is, um, if it is close to your home, but there is nothing like face-to-face. -face. And if you need to go drive there and knock on the door of the person who is there and tell them who you are, um, I would do that. I would take lots of pictures of, of, your, of your child, your son. I would show those pictures of what he was like beforehand. 
I don't know what his behavior was like beforehand, but I can tell you that my heart is so huge for young people who become paralyzed. It's no wonder they don't just go crazy and wind up in um, mental health facilities for the rest of their lives. I think it is actually a um, expected and natural behavior for them to have difficulties in that way. But it is not acceptable if they want to heal. And that's where another conversation I see exists between you and your son. And that's really where a mediator can help tremendously, where you bring in a third-party neutral who can help the two of you talk about that and what the consequences would be. He has a voice in that too. And if you're able to go to that facility and even with a recorded uh, recording from him about why he wants to be there, it could be something powerful too. If going to the facility uh, sounds too arduous and too difficult, um, there are other ways that you can get to them um, by phone and by letter, and you might just have to harness the relationships that we talked about that I hope you may have cultivated along, along the way. And if you don't have any of those, um, we can start now. Another call or another person has asked, what is the best way to get hospital nursing home staff to really listen to the patient? Well, I hope that you may have gotten some ideas uh, from what we talked about earlier. Um, that rounds concept can certainly be brought home with a hospital nursing home staff where you ask for a meeting. You could um, ask for it quite formally with uh, your family member. We did that at Shepherd Center. I, I did it in um, other facilities where we were, but at Shepherd it was wonderful because we were able to bring our son um, to, to that meeting, even though he wasn't able to, um, to speak, he could still participate. So asking for that meeting, you also might want to have a third party facilitator because I think what happens is you can feel very overwhelmed uh, by what seems like a power imbalance, but what is so important to remember is not only are you not alone, you know how to prepare, you can listen and reflect back what you hear, and you are as much of a power currency as that hospital and nursing home, and as the people in that hospital and nursing home. You all have information. It's about putting it together for your loved one, and that's also another great way to frame that meeting. Oh, goodness, we have so many other uh, questions. Here's another. Is there any drug or alcohol rehabilitation center that could accommodate my quadriplegic son? We have searched everywhere. That is where the Christopher Reeve Paralysis Resource Center can absolutely come in to assist you. You can call them, you can tell them where you're located um, or where you're willing to go, and they can assist you with that. Is that correct, Bernadette? Yes, it is. Um, this is a frequent inquiry that we get, and um, one of the key takeaways is that because the individual is a quadriplegic, you need to request for accommodations under the ADA for the facility to put in additional supports so that uh, your family member can get accepted. And when you approach it in that manner um, and you combine your mental health services with your medical services, you're more likely to be successful. Great, okay, thank you. And we'd be glad to assist you with that. I am noting that our time is up, but I'm just, I'd love to take one more of these questions. If I am the spinal cord patient, living alone, never married, no kids, and let's just assume no surviving relatives, am I stuck being my own advocate? No. Um, thanks to the Christopher Reeve Foundation and Hollister, you are not stuck. Hopefully you have gained some ideas here, calling those people and giving yourself a good team around you. But if you wish to call upon 
me or my services for whatever it is that you're facing, we can see how I could help you do that if indeed that's at all helpful. But also, there are lots of people around you, likely, who just don't necessarily know that you would like to have help with advocacy. And I hope that that is inspiring to you. I will leave this with what was opened with a Dana Reeve quote on hope, coupled that with Christopher Reeve's quote on creating a movement. And I believe that this gap in what is so needed, which we'll call relational advocacy, could become a movement. And I'm very hopeful, and I'm hopeful of what you all might be inspired and empowered to do on your own and how you can reach out to others to help you because you are never alone. And I thank you very much for this webinar. I wish you well. God bless. And um, special positive intentions for your loved ones who suffer with paralysis. Thank you. Great. Thank you for joining us today. And I'd like to remind you this is being recorded, and it will be archived on our YouTube channel by the end of the week, so you can take a look there. Thanks a lot for joining us, and hopefully you will join us again for no, another one of our webinars. And that does conclude today's webinar. Again, thank you for your participation.